Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present in GIS valves this year. So today I'll be presenting severe AS with a bicuspid pathology. My learning objectives is just a quick overview of what do we know about TAVR and a bicuspid aortic stenosis so far, to review the contemporary sizing methods, and then to apply the sizing methods on three cases. We're just going to go quickly over the cases for the sake of time. So how do we know so far? Just a quick uh, overview about the Sievers classification. We know that a bicuspid anatomy is classified according to Sievers classification based on the number of raphae. So if you have no raphae, you are, you are type 0, 1 raphae, type 1, 2 raphae is type 2, and most commonly left-right uh, left -right, uh, type 1 bicuspid aortic stenosis. All the data that we have regarding TAVI in a bicuspid valve coming from registry data and observational data. We don't have any randomized trials so far. So looking at the first report published in 2017 in Jack Bayon, comparing patient who underwent TAVI procedure with a bicuspid anatomy to a matched cohort with a tricuspid, steno a tricuspid aortic valve showed no difference in mortality. If we look closely at this data, Looking at patients who had the TAVR with an early generation devices, they had higher conversion to surgery, higher second valve implant, higher PVL, and higher uh, pacemaker rate. But these differences tend to disappear when we look at a newer generation devices. A few years after, in 2019, this data published from the TVT registry looking at patients who underwent uh, TAVI with a bicuspid stenosis. Uh, by using a, self, a balloon expandable valve, the S3 balloon expandable valve, comparing them to a matched cohort uh, with a tricuspid stenosis showing no difference in all-cause mortality. And the same thing was with the self-expandable Evolute platform. Also more recently, uh, Yon published a paper in Jack in 2020 looking at features suggestive of worst outcome for, uh, with bicuspid aortic stenosis and a population of patients, which represent around 26% of patients with a bicuspid aortic stenosis, they have severely calcified raphae, severe, or excessive calcification of the leaflets. They have worst outcomes, around 25% of all-cause mortality if treated with TAVI, compared, for, compared to someone who has no calcified uh, raphae or no excessive calcification of the leaflet. And also the excessive calcification is associated with a higher conversion rate, higher aortic root injury, and higher PVL. So let's talk about sizing. Sizing in a bicuspid anatomy is, um, can be divided into annular sizing and supraannular sizing. So I think we are all familiar with annular sizing. This is what we do with the anti-tricuspid anatomy. So you're going to trace the annulus and then perimeter area or a perimeter derived diameter based on your valve of choice. The supraannular sizing, there are four methods. In my opinion, the most reproducible, easy to use is the Bavard method. First of all, you're going to start with your annulus. You, measure, you trace your annulus. You get the annular derived parameter. You go four millimeter above the annulus. You measure the intercommissural distance. If the annulus, uh, annular parameter derived diameter is equals to the ICD, then you're going to size based on the annulus. It's a tube size, a tube shaped. If it's, if the annulus parameter derived diameter is smaller than the ICD, you're going to size based on the annulus. And if it's a taper shaped, that means the ICD is smaller than the annulus, then you're going to size based on the ICD. From the Bavard registry, around 88 to 90 percent of cases were sized based on annulus. Then we talk about the circle method. The circle method is only applicable if you are using a balloon expandable valve. You cannot use it with a self-expandable valve. So you trace your annulus, you, you size your valve based on the annulus. So let's say the annulus is a 26 valve. Then you're going to put two circles in the software you're using to analyze your uh, case. A 26 and a valve that's one size smaller, so a 23. And you project this from the LVOT all the way to the STJ. And you see the interaction with the uh, leaflet, with the uh, RAFI, and uh, with the STJ, and with the coronaries. And there's a lot of eyeballing and assessment of that. And if you see the, val the valve with the least interaction is going to cause you less problem, then you're going to pick up this size. 
Third method is the Casper method, which personally I've never used. It looks at the calcification and length of the rape and subtract anywhere between 0 to 2.5 millimeter from the annulus derived parameter. And finally, the Lira method, which is also a good method. In the Lira method, you start with your annulus, you trace it, and then you go up the annulus. When you see the point that there's a maximum projection of the rafi, then you're going to trace the area, the valve area, excluding the calcium. And you're going to measure this parameter. If this parameter is smaller than the annulus, then you're going to size it based on this parameter. Finally, the balloon sizing. In my opinion, you cannot use the balloon sizing as the only method to guide your case. It's a complementary sizing method to your case. So I think all of us or most of us agree that we should pre-dilate before any bicuspid aortic valve. That's my practice. We always pre-dilate. I pre-dilate based on the minor uh, diameter. If you pre-dilate and the balloon is inflated and you're worried about a coronary obstruction or you want to see how the calcium behave, then using the uh, balloon sizing as a complementary to your initial sizing strategy is helpful. So let's go over the cases. Case one is a 65 years old gentleman who came to us with heart failure and symptoms, diabetic and hypertensive. He had a coronary angiogram which showed non-significant CAD. He had an echo which showed a normal EF, a bicuspid anatomy, severe aortic stenosis. He's a young patient with a severe AS, bicuspid valve. We sent him for surgery. The patient absolutely declined surgery. And he said, if no, if you don't have a percutaneous option, I'd rather be left untreated. So we went ahead and we did a TAVI procedure. So you can see on the left-hand side is a bicuspid anatomy. It's a Severs type 1, left, right. Uh, he has an annulus perimeter of 95.9. So very large annulus with an area of 70, uh, 720. The perimeter-derived diameter is 30.5, and the ICD, which is 4 millimeter above the annulus, is 32.5. So the perimeter-derived diameter is smaller than the ICD. So we, we sized it based on the annulus using the, the Bavard sizing method. The coronary height was not an issue with generous sinuses. So at 30.5, uh, it's out of range for the 29 sapient valve. So we added a few cc's to the... Um, volume. The plan was to pre-dilate with a 23 millimeter balloon. It is, it, in this case, it was smaller than the minor diameter. And then uh, implant a Sapien 329 valve plus 3 cc. So that was our pre-dilatation followed by valve deployment. minimal leak post, and a gradient of three. Follow-up echo showed an EF of 65%, mean gradient of five, no PBL without a pericardial effusion. Our second case is a 77 years old gentleman who came in with NY check last three symptoms, hypertensive, severe COPD, non-significant CAD, uh, severe aortic stenosis with an EF of 45 to 50%, sent him for surgery, patient refused by the surgeon due to the severe COPD, so that's why we decided to go ahead and uh, with TAVR. On the left-hand side is a CFRS type 1, um, annulus parameter of 87.7, with a perimeter derived diameter of 27.9, and an ICD, which you can see is 4 millimeter above the annulus plane, is 28.5, so we sized it based on the annulus. Coronary height to the left was 10.9, the right was not an issue with very generous sinuses. So we pre-dilated with a 24 millimeter balloon, so it's a minor diameter plus one, and uh, implanted a 34 millimeter Avalute Pro uh, self-expandable valve. In this case, we had the pre-dilatation was extremely challenging. We tried pre-dilating dil this valve around seven or eight times, despite rapid pacing and everything, the balloon kept moving. Eventually, that was our last dilatation, we went ahead and deployed the valve, and when we deployed the valve, we knew that we're gonna have a uh, valve constraint and we planned the post-dilatation because of suboptimal pre-dilatation. So you can appreciate here that the valve is, is constrained, and then we went ahead and post-dilated again. 
with a 24 millimeter true balloon with good valve expansion. And the uh, final gradient was one millimeter of mercury. And as what we do from our self-expandable implant, we try to get coronary access immediately post, and there was no issue in this case with getting the coronary access after. Uh, Follow-up echo EF of 50 to 55 percent with a mean gradient of 12 and a DVI of 0.7, no pericardial fusion. Last case, this is a case we did a couple of weeks ago. He's a 55 years old gentleman <coughs> admitted to the CCU with cardiogenic shock. Uh, reported history of chest pain and shortness of breath. Uh, he reported that a few, a few weeks ago he was in his home country, admitted to, with heart failure to a hospital and diagnosed with severe AS and multi-vessel disease, but he refused surgery. It's a typo here, said so he refused coronary angiogram. He refused surgery and flew to Kuwait. He's diabetic, hypertensive, and dyslipidemia. And his angio said, as I said, uh, reported to have multi-vessel CAD. His echo, when admitted to us, was 20% severe AS, heavily calcified valve, uh, and with mild AMR. So the plan, as it was initially, is for cabbage and AVR. The, but the patient was declined by our surgeon due to his hemodynamic instability. The patient was in shock on levofid and dobutamine. So our plan was to do the coronary angiogram, do a balloon aortic valvuloplasty as maybe a temporizing measure until a final decision regarding surgery versus TAVR and PCI. First, we did a CT TAVI for him, which you can appreciate that he has a calcified RAFI with a parameter of 82.7 and a parameter derived diameter of 26.3 and an ICD 27.3. So if we want to go ahead and do a TAVI, it's going to be based on the annulus measurements. His left coronary high was around 10 and the right was not an issue. So the first thing was the angiogram and the bath procedure. You can see here that the LAD, if you look at the right injection first, the LAD is a CTO and it's filled by the right and the circ is severely diseased. The circ is severely diseased and there's a CTO of the LAD. The RCA was also severely diseased and it's filling the LAD system. So he had a balloon uh, valvuloplasty, tried to buy some time before a final decision was made with a smaller balloon. After the balloon valvuloplasty, the patient had some improvement in his hemodynamics, less pressures, but still uh, not in a great shape for surgery. So we decided to go ahead and do TAVI. That was a couple of weeks after the balloon valvuloplasty. So the plan was to pre-dilate with a 22 millimeter true balloon, uh, sized according to the minor diameter, and then a TAVI with a my valve 27.5 millimeter valve, um, as his uh, annulus was, uh, annular diameter is 26.5. So the TAVI procedure, pre-dilatation, so we wanted to do the TAVI before the PCI because we were worried about hemodynamic collapse during the PCI with a severe AS. So pre-dilated, 27 my valve implanted. While we are inflating the, uh, deploying the valve, the patient uh, arrested and had uh, some resuscitation. At that point, you can appreciate that the valve is not fully uh, expanded, that there was a lot of resistance while pushing this balloon, but we decided to stop pushing as the patient here, if you can see, reduced contractility, and we started the resuscitation, very short resuscitation. Mm -hmm. The patient came back, and uh, that was the final. So there was uh, no leak and the minimal gradient. We decided to go ahead and fix the circ in the same setting and leave the LAD and the RCA for a stage procedure. His, that was a couple of weeks ago. His EF, his most uh, last echo was done uh, last week. His EF is 35 to 40% with a mean gradient of 11 and DVI of 0.59 with no pericardial effusion. So my key message is TAVR for BAV is for selected cases, assess the risk, it's calcium, 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 uh, calcium of the leaflets, calcium of the RAFI, integrate annular and supraannular sizing method, and the balloon sizing is complementary to your initial sizing strategy. Thank you.